Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right away. Attention. Enemy bombers sighted. Time, 1400-1400, 70 miles, 70 miles north of this field, flying east, flying east at 20,000 to 0,000 feet. Take off immediately. Check this. Attention. Enemy bombers sighted. Time, Come on, fellas. They're not going to wait for us. Be right back, honey. Airplanes can function at greater heights than man. The battle for altitude depends upon pilots who know what they're up against, know how to use their oxygen equipment, and then use it. It will not be won by this pilot, who clings to the outmoded theory that a good pilot can hold his own at any altitude. And he, of course, is a good pilot. So he is, up to 12,000 feet. So are the others in his flight. Yet some have already been using oxygen to play safe in rapid climb. And others are turning it on now to be ready for higher altitude. Fifteen thousand feet. The critical altitude at which oxygen must be used. Seventeen thousand feet. What now of the good pilot? His heart is thumping. His vision is blurred. He needs oxygen. But the greater danger is that he doesn't recognize his trouble. He keeps on, still sure that he can climb to any height, although he's no longer fit to fly.
He said so. His commander said so. But at a crucial moment, he knew more about high altitudes than men who have spent their lives studying the subject. With luck, he might regain consciousness in time to pull out. Upstairs, five men are fighting the fight of six. The lack of one plane may tip the scale. The battle may be lost because of... extends for about 70 miles. Man has adjusted himself to varying climatic conditions on Earth. But whether a pilot is stationed in the tropics or the Arctic, in summer or winter, it's always cold in the stratosphere. Every pilot knows that the higher he goes, the colder it gets. Under standard conditions, the temperature drops two degrees centigrade for every thousand feet of altitude gain. This is true up to 35,000 feet, where the thermometer reads 55 degrees below zero, and sometimes even lower. Above 35,000 feet, the temperature remains fairly constant. These conditions of extreme cold and means of combating them have been studied extensively in refrigerated chambers which duplicate high altitude conditions. Defense against cold depends upon proper clothing for all flight personnel. This is especially true at high altitudes since cabin heaters are not yet adequate. The intermediate flying suit worn by this man will offer little protection against cold for any great length of time. standard winter suit provides, under most conditions, very efficient protection. The parka is longer and roomier, equipped with a protecting hood. Here is the new electrically heated suit, generally worn under coveralls. It is much less bulky than the parka. In the electric suit, sewn-in heating wires are connected to the airplane power supply. Mittens are heated in the same way, and are plugged into the sleeves. This suit provides as much protection from the cold as the standard winter suit. The chamber is turned on to duplicate temperature and low pressure conditions encountered at high altitudes. Inside, the reactions of the four men to these conditions can be observed. In a forced landing in cold weather, the heavy suits have the advantage of providing protection away from the airplane. However, movement is somewhat restricted. The less bulky electrically heated suit permits greater freedom of movement. It would not protect a man on the ground in a cold climate since it's useless away from the airplane's power supply. Therefore, this suit serves best in warm climates. Another advantage of the heated suit is that current can be adjusted to the wearer's comfort. The temperature is 35 below zero centigrade at a simulated altitude of 25,000 feet. After half an hour at this temperature, the pilot in the intermediate suit is first to notice the cold. This suit is perfectly adequate for fighter pilots who are exposed to extreme cold for only a short while but not for too long. Thoroughly convinced of this, 
The man here is quite ready to be brought back down to earth. Obviously, this intermediate suit will be little help to bomber and observation personnel who engage in five or six hour long missions at high altitude. To prevent frostbite, the face should be felt occasionally, and if any spot has become numb, it should be rubbed gently to restore circulation. Low temperatures demand that the body produce heat at a high rate. To produce this heat, the human engine, like an airplane engine, must have sufficient oxygen. The oxygen mask is the human supercharger. At the end of the four-hour test at 25,000 feet, none of the men is feeling any discomfort, despite the temperature of 35 below. With an adequate intake of oxygen, suitable flying clothes, and reasonable care, airplane crews will be fully protected during prolonged exposure to low temperatures. has weight. This can easily be demonstrated. All the air has been pumped out of this flask, which is in perfect balance. When the stopcock is opened, the weight of the air admitted alters the balance. This weight is called atmospheric pressure. The force of this pressure can clearly be seen when the air is drawn out of this can, and the weight of the air outside collapses. Every pilot knows that atmospheric pressure grows less with altitude. The inflated balloon in this testing chamber is subjected to normal sea level pressure. By means of a pump, the pressure in the chamber is decreased to simulate ascent into the atmosphere. At sea level, the air within the balloon was compressed by the weight of the air outside. But as altitude is gained, less pressure is exerted upon the balloon and the air within expands. This is important to the pilot because during ascent, gases in the digestive tract expand in exactly the same manner. The balloon has expanded to double its original size at 18,000 feet. At higher altitudes, this expansion may be great enough to create abdominal cramps. In extreme cases, it may cause fainting. Another common effect of pressure variation noted at all altitudes is upon the ear. The part so affected is the ear drum. When pressure on the body decreases, the air within the ear tends to expand. This will force the ear drum outward, causing pain. Unless the increased pressure is released through this slender tube into the throat. During descent, air must re-enter through the same passage. If this tube becomes clogged, as when a coal develops, the external pressure will be greater and the drum will be pushed inward. Excessive tension may result in rupture of the drum. Once the tube is cleared, the drum returns to normal. The same problem is presented by the sinuses, which are air-filled cavities 
connected to the nose by narrow openings or ducts. So long as these ducts are clear, internal and external pressure can be equalized. Should they be closed by a head cold, the pressures will vary. This condition may result in severe headache. Usually during climb, little trouble is experienced from either ears or sinus. However, during descent, pressure must be equalized. Ordinarily, this can be done by yawning or swallowing. This fails. Blowing the nose with the jaws tightly closed will force air into the sinuses and ears. Sometimes the use of a simple inhaler will help to keep these passages open. It may be necessary to reascend to clear the ears, then descend more slowly. Radio communication makes good hearing essential to good flying. These few simple precautions will safeguard ears. within, releasing the gas from solution in the liquid. This gas escapes in the form of bubbles. On a much smaller scale, when pressure on the human body is rapidly reduced, nitrogen in the bloodstream is released in the form of bubbles. These bubbles may form at altitudes as low as 20,000 feet, but do not cause any noticeable effects until about 30 to 35,000 feet. The common symptoms of aeroembolism are a tingling, itchy skin, pain in the joints or muscles, and pain in the chest aggravated by deep breathing. Ability to withstand low pressure for extended periods is a matter of individual resistance, which can be predetermined by the flight surgeon. Pains may become so severe that the sufferer is unable to perform his duties and may even collapse. During descent, increasing pressure drives the nitrogen back into solution so that the effects of aeroembolism are usually dispelled. Use of pure oxygen on the ground prior to flight or a half hour of exercise while breathing pure oxygen will remove nitrogen from the body and help prevent aeroembolism. Use of oxygen from the ground up is recommended on high altitude flights. Aeroembolism is much less dangerous than divers' bends. No permanent injury to the body has been known to occur. Life-giving oxygen, as everyone knows, is taken into the lungs through breathing. From the lungs, it is driven by pressure into the blood and so is carried away to supply the cells of the body. However, as the total atmospheric pressure decreases, the partial pressure of oxygen decreases in direct proportion. Therefore, as altitude is gained, less and less oxygen is forced into the blood. The result is anoxia a condition of disorder in oxygen-starved muscles and nerve cells. When the partial pressure of oxygen falls so low that none enters the bloodstream, death follows quickly. The effect of anoxia will be demonstrated here in the pressure chamber. How are you? I feel fine. Yeah. 
one man will wear the regulation oxygen mask. The sergeant will go up without oxygen. All ready in there? Yes, sir. We're ready. Okay, you're going up. Take him up, Ben. Ability to play cards illustrates the type of clear thinking and muscular control required of all flight personnel. At low altitudes, both players conduct themselves well. Generally, there are no appreciable effects up to an altitude of 10,000 feet. There's 10,000. Above 10,000 feet, Oxygen should be used for flights of six hours or more. Above 12,000 feet, for two hours or more. And above 15,000 feet, at all times. On night missions, it is vital that oxygen be taken from the ground up in order to preserve vision. These definite rules must be followed because men suffering from lack of oxygen are unable to judge when oxygen should be used. Soon after 10,000 feet, the first symptoms of anoxia become apparent to the observer. The subject, however, is not worried in the least. The effects of anoxia are strikingly similar to those of intoxication, and individual responses are just as many and varied. Length of exposure and degree of oxygen lack, general physical condition of the individual, and variations among persons all affect the way in which anoxia shows up. But in every case, a person's judgment and coordination are hit first. For this reason, flight personnel suffering from lack of oxygen are incompetent to judge how well they are performing their duty. You're at 15,000 now. The man using the mask is alert to his need of oxygen at this critical altitude. But the man without oxygen, suppose he were a pilot at the controls of his plane. Remember, there's nothing staged about this demonstration. The sergeant volunteered to risk going up without oxygen so that flight personnel might witness what actually happens when oxygen fails. Put yourself in his shoes and watch closely. Twenty thousand. Twenty thousand.
the surest guarantees of safety at high altitudes. Here, a bomber pilot is keeping himself in shape. But suppose the co-pilot has spent the evening in this type of exercise. The lower turret gunner foolishly makes his lunch on a heavy assortment of gas-forming foods. And the radio operator. Suppose he is losing out in a private fight with a lusty head cold which blocks those vital passages to ears and sinuses. Probably none of the three mentioned should tackle high altitudes, but up they go. And with what result? Well, that remains to be seen. Oxygen equipment is inspected prior to takeoff. Knowing that they are going straight up to high altitudes, all crew members start using oxygen at once, all but the bombardier. He knows all about high altitude. Most any day he can be found bragging off how high he's climbed without a mask. Gunner's a little behind the others in plugging in his oxygen line. More careless, too, in not locking the plug. bomber takes off for high altitude regions, with several members of its crew variously unprepared to cope with low pressure and oxygen conditions. Yet every member of the crew is vital to the success of any mission. Sparks, of course, is still battling his cold, and as they go up, it doesn't get any better. Meanwhile, the bombardier is sitting on top of the world, never more sure that he can do his own breathing without any outside help. Back in the tail, the gunner's ready, or thinks he's ready, but that loose hose connection can't hold against the vibration of the plane. Above 20,000 feet, things begin to happen. The bombardier still doesn't know he needs oxygen. But it's too late anyhow. The bomber might fight through to its target, but all in vain. The mission would fail because of one wise guy. The tail gunner, too, is far from well. He thinks he's been using oxygen right along. But for safety's sake, he should have remembered to check his line at regular intervals. Now, it's too late. The tail of the bomber is wide open to enemy attack. Thus, one man's folly could seal the fate of all. And what of the lower turret gunner? Low pressure has brought on painful abdominal cramps. He's suffering from that ill-chosen lunch, while the radio operator continues to suffer from his cold. 
an open invitation to Messerschmitt and Zero Fighter. Around 30,000 feet, the co-pilot begins to suffer. His resistance lowered from too much nightlife, he falls easy prey to aeroembolism, under conditions which he's withstood many times when in good shape. To save him, the pilot must descend, thus sacrificing all the advantages of a high-altitude airplane. Even as the ship descends, more trouble develops. Sparks is in great pain. He can scarcely hear. What now if a vital message came in? A message of life or death to the entire crew. In actual service, although it could happen, it's unlikely that five members of a crew would thus be overtaken in a single flight. But it doesn't take five to spell defeat. It doesn't take four or three or two. Any single crew member who fails at his post can bring failure to all. The best airplane in the world will be useless against a much inferior machine if the crew of that perfect airplane does not have the necessary stuff. The battle for altitude may well decide the war. That battle could be lost through sheer carelessness. That battle will be won by intelligent flying personnel who follow the established common sense rules and exercise simple but necessary precautions to get on top and stay there.